Our next speaker, again, another guy that doesn't need any introduction but deserves one. Uh, Chief Liber Liberty Officer at uh, Liberty.me and uh, published author Jeffrey Tucker. Thank you. So I'd first like to thank Andreas for giving one of the finest public lectures I've heard in my entire life. That was overwhelming to me. Uh, I just tweeted out that the world needs to recognize immediately that this man is a genius. So uh, I always think when I hear Andreas, I think, oh, I, I could say that if I had another couple of years to think about it. <laughs> it's amazing. So thank you so much for holding this, this marvelous conference in this uh, very strange and beautiful land that, again, I, I, um, being an American, of course, we have a vague sense that nowhere else in the world really exists. So. Um, being here has been just an incredible revelation to me uh, in so many ways. It just, it's just a, a perfect place. So thank you so much for inviting me and for holding this beautiful conference. So I'd like to use my time today to, I don't know, just kind of um, unburden myself on a subject that's troubled me or, or consumed me over the last couple of years. And it has to do with the history of monetary policy. I'd, I'd like to kind of march you through a, a history of of folly and disaster with monetary policy over the last century. And the whole subject sort of amuses me because, you know, it's a history of tens of thousands of the world's smartest people trying to manage an unmanageable uh, system, putting in place a paradigm that was fundamentally failed at its very root, and no one could really think their way out of it until very recently. And, and to me, it's a great example of of exactly what Andreas was talking about, people being sort of you know, unable to think through what the world should look like on their own. Uh, when you centralize knowledge, you end up with folly and, and, and error and, and disaster. When you decentralize knowledge and, and let the markets manage it, you get you know, much better, more brilliant, emergent results that are, that are coming about over time. But what's interesting to me is that we didn't really know this until very recently. Like, we didn't really have a sense of how bad the system was until about 2000, uh, two, 2009, really. And for me personally, it took another three years after that to really believe that Bitcoin was real and to understand exactly what was happening. So I feel myself uh, to be very much of a student of Satoshi Nakamoto, actually, in some ways, and a student of this, of this global emergent order which has surprised not just me, but every monetary economist in the world with um, innovations that nobody really thought was, was possible. Uh, last night we used Bitcoin at, at dinner to trade uh, money back and forth, to pay our bills, and, and I did that on the way in you know, with sh cab sharing. And I don't know about you, but every time I use Bitcoin, I get just like this huge kick. You know? It's just like, whoa, yeah! Yeah, and just want to sort of throw my fist in the air and pump and go, yeah, this is the future. This is just great. It's so much fun. It's so, so wonderful. Uh, I always like to compare it to, uh, you know, if you've spent a whole lifetime driving around a Model T and then somebody pulls up in a, Marathi, uh, in a Maserati and says, hop in, you know? That's how Bitcoin always feels to me. So I'm looking forward to the future. I, I dread the past. Nonetheless, we're going to, uh, we're going to take a, a few minutes here to kind of romp through the past and the history of this thing called monetary policy, which was sort of more or less invented in the late 19th century. Nobody really thought of a need for monetary policy before then. There, wasn't, there, wasn't a, a school of, there weren't schools of thought and experts that were going to manage our money because there wasn't such a thing as central banking. Um, the very first central bank was, was uh, well, in a modern sense, came about in Germany in um, 1878 at the height of Bismarck's social democratic, you know, big, big government experience, uh, experiments. And central banking was a very important part of that. Uh, in the US, we didn't really get central banking until 1913. Uh, um, we went through seven stages, really, of monetary policy in the course of the 20th century. So I'd just kind of like to mark, march through those to illustrate the level of naivety. I really think that all of this stuff is, is basically at an end. We're at the beginning stages of the breakdown of this thing called monetary science or monetary policy or monetary systems managed by experts from the top down in cooperation with governments and, and banks. Uh, that's clearly you know, not going to be our future. So I think it'd be sort of interesting to go through the history. So I've listed seven stages here. The first one is this, uh, uh, the first stage is what I would just call the naive scientific stage. 
If you read any of the academic journals between, say, 1908 and about 1912, um, you, you're going to find some very interesting stuff in there. Almost every living economist favored central banking. And they liked it because they imagined they would finally get a hold of uh, the system and be able to add the, the, the merits of science itself to managing money. You know, the, the impetus for central banking in the U.S. came about after the banking crisis of 1907, which was one of many, of, of a long series of banking crises that came about from uh, too much of a merger of banks and, and governments, too much of a tendency to socialize the costs of banking, and therefore skew risk assessment, and privatize the gains from banking. So 1907 was a, was, a, was a kind of a shocking moment in American history for many people because uh, many banks you know, became insolvent uh, as a result of too many booms and busts through the late years of railroad empire building and bank failures all over the place. Ro depositors were robbed and looted. Uh, there was a, you know, a history of business cycles. And finally, said, okay, everybody said, okay, that's enough. What we really need is a great team of experts, people with a high level of knowledge, massive resources and enormous power to implement a system that's more rational than the, the strange market anarchism of the past, where we had wildcat banking and confusion and nobody, nobody knew what was going on. The result was the Federal Reserve. And the economists of the time, uh, the pompous jerks that they almost always are, uh, imagined that they could really truly control the system and do a brilliant job at it. And what were they trying to do? What were their goals? I mean, their goals were, were, first, the solvency of the banking system, which everybody forgets about. That's not really mentioned in the official uh, sort of uh, uh, job mandate of the Federal Reserve. You know, always, you always hear about, about the mandate of the Federal Reserve to maintain low inflation, to smooth out business cycles, uh, to keep unemployment low. But the first, in, uh, the first job of the central bank, actually, has always been to maintain the solvency of the banking system. And guess what? That ends up being the, not just the first priority, but pretty much the only priority. You know, everything else falls after that. That's always been true for the last 100 years. Um, so that, that was a major factor. But the other one was, of course, in the early, early years of central banking, maintaining low inflation and, and uh, maintaining a certain economic stability. It was part of a kind of a larger apparatus of, of ideological conceit that, managed, that imagined that the more power you could centralize at the top, the better the system would, would become, and the more we could sort of engineer and manufacture prosperity through science. So the Federal Reserve was created, really the very first fully centralized system in the US. There had been other experiments with national banking, that sort of thing, but this was a real central bank. It was, a, it was a banking, creation of a banking cartel. And essentially it worked like this. Uh, government would, 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 would cartelize the banks, give them special privileges to operate, and guarantee them against failure, in return for which the banking system would underwrite government debt and make governments too big to fail, essentially. And, and eliminate the default-based premium that has always been attached to every kind of de debt instrument, suddenly government debt would be the first kind of debt that would not have a default premium. It would always pay. No matter what, you would get your money. It didn't matter whether the money had any value or not, but you would always get paid. That was the deal. That's the way it worked. And the economists were so excited about this because, of course, as is always the case, they imagined that they would be the ones in charge of it. And it's really, really fun to be in charge. So that's the way it worked. That's, the way, that's, that's how monetary economics was born. There was no such thing as monetary science uh, in, a, in a policy sense before then. Um, you know, if you don't have a centralized system managed and controlled by governments, there's no reason for a policy about it, right? And as soon as you have a policy, you have controversy. So for example, uh, I don't know what's going on in New Zealand, but in the US we have no national tennis shoe policy at all because tennis shoes are mostly manufactured by private enterprise, you know, so we don't have a national tennis shoe. If we did have a national tennis shoe policy, there would be an enormous debate about whether we should have, um, you know, loafers or uh, flip-flops or, you know, whatever the case may be, Oxfords or whatever. But we don't have such a policy, so it's left generally to the market what kind of things pe people wear in their shoes. 
what, what they were on their feet. But with monetary policy and central banks, you suddenly had a gigantic controversy. What are going to be the priorities? What should we use this for? But of course, the economists were woefully naive, as they always are. The very first thing that happened after the fir first stage of naive science was the Great War. That's what governments use central banks for. Not for smoothing out inflation, not for getting rid of, rid of business cycles, not for boosting employment, not for any of those things. It was used to fund the first real experience the world had ever seen in a total global war of mass murder and poison gas and conscription and despotism. That's what central banks were used for, war. War and then revolution. Because, of course, the consequences of the war in most countries around the world was economic upheaval. This was, for example, the reason for the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. I mean, it didn't come about because Lenin was just a great orator. It came about because people were sick of the conscription and especially the inflation that they had to endure, which is a form of robbery. They overthrew the government in response to the, the inflationary finance of Russia's war. And, in the, and uh, in the U.S. It was the same situation. There would have been no entry into World War I if the U.S. had to collect its revenue through taxation. If it could just generate revenue by depreciating the, mon the, the existing money, then there wasn't a question. You just enter the war, it's no problem. All the problems of finance are, are over. I mean, central banks really liberated governments to do whatever they wanted to for the first time. And Ludwig von Mises in 1919, in his great book, Nation, State, and Economy, says there would have been no great war at all had it not been for central banking. So this is the second great stage of, of monetary policy in the 20th century, war and revolution. Because after the war, of course, the debts had to be paid. There's no such thing as free money. In the end, somebody has to pay the bill. And that's what went on throughout the, 19, the late 19-teens and 1920s in Germany. It resulted in the great hyperinflation of 1922 and 1923, uh, a time in which uh, uh, money became f far less valuable than any vessel you could carry that money in. So uh, if you were walking down the street with your well barrel full of, of paper money, uh, the great danger was not having your money stolen, but your well barrel stolen. That was actually the, <laughs> the most valuable thing that you were carrying around. In the US, it led to, uh, and of course, you know, that hyperinflation in Germany eventually led to the rise of Hitler, by the way. There's no question about that. The collapse of, 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 of the old German currency uh, what really meant the collapse of all sort of affection for Manchesterism and freedom itself, leading to massive despotism. And, and Hitler used resentment against the war debts to come to power. And in the US, it led to an economic boom throughout the 1920s that eventually led in the, in the stock market uh, bubble and subsequent bust of 1929. And it's true really all over the world. Massive monetary instability throughout the 1920s, late 1920s, leading to the Great Depression. First stage, naive science. Second stage, war and revolution. The third stage is, is what I call uh, first wave Keynesianism. Okay? This is very interesting because the first wave of Keynesianism came about long before Keynesianism had ever been defined by Lord Keynes himself. You know? It was practiced. Uh, Lord Keynes' book, General, General Theory, uh, came out in 1936. But Keynesianism was already being practiced and, uh, by 1930 under Hoover. Uh, why is that? It's because Keynes Keynesianism is a very interesting doctrine of, of, of economic life. If you could kind of like put together a list of all the things that governments would like to do if they were allowed to get away with it, uh, basically you would have Keynesian theory. You know, that's, that's the whole of it. It's all the things the government would like to do, but it typically is not allowed to do because people resent being looted and manipulated and, and robbed. Uh, so Keynesianism was sort of a codification of a theory of despotism. There was really no more or less than that. But it didn't work, actually. It's fascinating to me. When you look at back at the history of monetary policy in the early 1930s, people don't understand this. The popular conception of what happened under, under the Great Depression, and this, you can read this in every textbook, is that um, uh, Hoover was a laissez-faire uh, liberal, uh, you know, attached to uh, the free market and did not want to use government power, central banking power to bail out the banks. He just kind of let all these kind of banking failures happen uh, 
and then uh, FDR came to, came to the rescue, but even he was overly naive, let a massive deflation take place, failed to understand the need to, to inflate the currency, and so we suffered under a regime of falling prices for 10 years, and we just couldn't get away from it, and it was just a, a terrible thing that every day you went to the store and prices were lower uh, than they were before, just a horrible, horrible oppression. And even today, you read in the New York Times about the great deflationary threat headed our way. Now, yeah, I'm so sick of these articles. Every day I, I read them in the newspaper. Oh my God, what are we going to do about the deflationary threat? But it's true that there was a constant, constantly falling prices throughout the, the 1930s. What's fascinating, though, and people don't understand this, if you look back at the history of what central banks were actually doing, this is particularly in the, in, uh, the US, where the, central bank, where the center of central banking was not Washington, D.C., but New York, they tried desperately to inflate. It's not true that they just let bank failures run amok and failed to inflate the money supply and, and naively let this deflation happen. It happened despite the attempt by the New York Federal Reserve to manufacture an inflation, but they couldn't do anything about it because the debt overhang was too intense, it was too high, and monetary velocity completely collapsed. People started putting money in their, in their mattresses instead of taking it to the banks. And the savings rate went through the roof because people were extremely risk averse and banks themselves were unwilling to lend. Um, despite a, a whole series of successive attempts to manufacture a low interest rate policy and bring about an inflation. This is a very interesting experience. And again, you won't read about this in the textbooks. It's fascinating to me because uh, there's always an impression you get from people who write the history that whatever the results are of a policy is precisely what was intended by the policymakers. And yet that's hardly ever the case. So in the, in the case of early first wave Keynesianism in the early 1930s, the, they desperately tried to manufacture an inflation, but it did not stick because there's certain things that are out of control of the central bankers. Now as I'm telling that story, you might be thinking in your own head about like what happened in 2008 and 2009 and 2010 with central banks lowering, lowering inflation, lowering uh, interest rates all over the world, desperately trying to manufacture inflation, but like failing uh, in the most extreme way. This is an exact repetition of what happened in the early 1930s in first wave Keynesianism. Uh, what's, what's most interesting, too, is that the monetary scientists at the time really confused cause and effect. They thought that the falling prices were the cause of the recession, so that if you could somehow lift up prices, that would cause prosperity to reemerge. I mean, this is the stupidest theory you can possibly ever imagine, but this is what they all believed. Uh, just as after 2008, um, uh, the cent central bankers and uh, policy elites imagined that the real problem with the American economy was that housing prices had fallen. And if we could just raise the price of housing, then we would manufacture a new kind of prosperity. I mean, just, just an incredibly naive view. Now, the first wave of Keynesianism lasted for uh, the whole of 1930s until, of course, the great Second World War. Again, another war that was entirely uh, made possible by the existence of central banks. It never would have happened without it. No chance. So Keynesianism, and then, then wartime planning was, of course, you know, just an unbelievable thing, really. Uh, uh, the US imagined it was fighting fascism and despotism and dictatorship all over the world. Um, but as a matter of fact, it was creating that very same thing at home. Uh, prices were controlled, wages were controlled, you know, every aspect of, you know, there's massive, you know, censorship, every aspect of economic life was, was entirely, you know, top-down sort of fascism. So the, the U.S. was, its war propaganda was all about dictatorship, you know, we're going to end dictatorship abroad and, 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 and stop tyranny. Uh, meanwhile, at home, you had, you know, people being uh, uh, put in internment camps, uh, uh, merchants arrested for charging uh, too high a price, you know, we, we went from, we went from a, a policy a decade earlier of mandating higher prices to, in the 1940s, forbidding higher prices. You know, this, this is the way it worked. I mean, it's just this kind of a crazy system. Um, the U.S. entered into an, a, into an allied relationship with Russia. 
after having spent, you know, uh, the previous 10 years all wound up about the Red Scare for the world, suddenly Stalin went from being uh, the great devil to being the great hero, only to revert back again, you know, immediately as the war ended to suddenly, you know, um, Truman discovered that, that Russia was, was actually the great devil after all, you know. Uh, Orwell's uh, book 1984 was just a little bit of a play on a date. The year he was actually referring to was 1948, actually. I don't know if you knew that. That's true. He was describing the world of 1948, not forecasting a future, but describing a present reality. So this is the first wave of, of, of Keynesianism. And of course, monetary economists all over the world were convinced by, by Keynes' theory. And it's one of the most bizarre chapters in intellectual history how this happened. I mean, how, how Lord Keynes took over the world is something that I can't even today fathom. You know, and I've read just like countless books on this topic. Like, like how do you become master of the universe, you know, having manufactured one of the great calamities in human history? I don't understand it. I mean, there wasn't anything about Keynesian policy that got us out of the Great Depression. You know, even school kids are taught every day. Uh, FDR saved us from the Great Depression. Well, wait a minute. I mean, he became president in 1932. He stayed president. You know, he was president for three terms, all the way to the end of World War II. Um, the Great Depression didn't go away. He didn't save us from anything. In fact, he prolonged it. I mean, that, that's what's amazing. Nonetheless, Keynesianism emerges on the other side, completely dominant across the whole of the economics profession. And you found only like two or three prominent opponents of Keynesian theory in uh, the late 1940s and early 1950s. For the most part, he just won the world over. And why? You know, there's a number of theories. Apparently, for one thing, he was impossibly charming, which, you know, we always underestimate this, right? Like, like what the personal appeal of a, of a figure is in history. Uh, but apparently, he would enter the room, and he was something like 6'4". Uh, he was an aristocrat. Uh, unbelievably, unbearably charming, very agile in dealing and talking to you know, the, the, the most powerful people in the world. He just blew people away with his, his sort of a magnificence and glow and glories. And uh, he also had this am amazing way of, of, of talking in such an obscure way that it just naturally caused uh, people who were stupider than he to to just assent to whatever he said. You know, they would just sort of agree with him, no matter what he said. He had this sort of air of expertise about him. That was one thing. That had to be part of it, just his incredible charm. Um, Mises himself was, was furious about, about the rise of, of Lord Keynes, uh, because after the war, there was this big monetary, global monetary conference where they, they tried to cobble together a new monetary system for the world called Britain Woods. And uh, the World Bank and the IMF were created, and also special drawing rights, which is supposed to be the new global currency. And uh, Mises was not, of course, invited, and, but he attended. And he said uh, most of the time, he saw Lord Keynes looking down at his shoes, checking the, the shine on the buckle to make sure it was just pristine and beautiful. And, uh, and, and you know, more consumed about his looks than any of the details about monetary policy. Uh, Mises was very bitter uh, about this, because as he described Keynes's theory of money, it was just an attempt to make bread out of stones. You know, that's a summary of, of Keynesian economics, according to, to Mises. So then we entered into the second wave of Keynesian theory. This would have been in the early 1970s. Uh, this is an, an amazing moment in history when Richard Nixon gets on, on now, the Britain Woods system that was cobbled together in the late 1940s for the world put the world on what, what was called uh, a, a dollar exchange standard. It was based in gold, um, but gold couldn't be exchanged domestically by anybody. There was no convertibility within borders, but there was convertibility across borders. So the whole world was on a dollar system, but to maintain the stability of the system, gold had to be like, physically transported on boats back and forth to various countries. So there was no monetary discipline within borders, but the international system had to balance itself out in terms of gold internationally. This is an unworkable system. Uh, a great economist named Henry Hazlitt was at the time working for the New York Times and predicted that this, this whole system would, 
would come collapsing down. Uh, and he did this in a series of editorials for the New York Times, if you can imagine. But then one day, the editor came in to him and said, you know, Henry, it's not really working for us for you to be against the, the Britain Woods system, since it's a fait accompli, and all the world elites are for it. And this is what all the monetary scientists say is the right thing. And all the governments in the world agree it's the right thing. So you have to change your position. And Henry said, well, thanks very much for that information. I need to just pack up my stuff, and I'll leave. And he quit the New York Times in light of this, actually. And then wrote his great book in about 10 days called Economics in One Lesson. It was an attempt to school uh, uh, his own editors of the New York Times and certain, certain economic realities that they were denying uh, to themselves. And to this day, it remains the best-selling economics book of all time, written in 10 days. Anyway, so the second wave of Keynesianism comes about in 1973, when, of course, the Great Britain Wood system comes collapsing down. The US decided that it was panicked because it was having to ship too much gold outside of its borders, uh, started to worry about this, and basically you know, decided to default on all contracts. All gold clause uh, contracts were declared null and void. And uh, Richard Nixon got on national television and announced the great news of the inauguration of a new era of money. There would no longer be any restraints whatsoever on the power of central banks and, and governments to create money since we were finally at the end of the age of the gold standard once and for all. We were done with the barbarous metal. And finally, at long last, we could have the application of science to monetary policy without any restraints of the old world. And so what happened? Well, <laughs> the most amazing thing happened of all. In 1976, we saw the origin of uh, stagflation. Now, stagflation is something that's supposed to be macroeconomically impossible, according to Keynesian theory. There was a trade-off, supposed to be in theory, between inflation and unemployment. So if you have very high un uh, uh, unemployment, the way to get out of it is to manufacture a great inflation. And that would reduce unemployment down to uh, its, its preferred levels. And um, uh, if, if unemployment got really too low, then you could manufacture, uh, a, 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 you could, uh, well, see, there would be like an inverse trade-off. So the higher, the higher the rate of inflation, the lower the rate of unemployment. And the higher the rate of unemployment, the lower, rate, the lower the rate of inflation. So you had to constantly choose between two forms of misery, essentially. That's Keynesian theory in a nutshell. But by 1976, we saw this impossible thing happening, where there was both high unemployment and high inflation. There was nothing within Keynesian theory that could have explained this at all. It wasn't supposed to exist. It's like you're pushing on the gas and the brake at the same time. According to the Keynesian theory, it's like it's, it's causing uh, something that's like physically impossible. And yet, once again, Keynesian theory was not discredited. We just moved on to the next wave. 1979, actually, the US economy um, nearly uh, entered into a stage of hyperinflation. Uh, we had 13, as high as 15% inflation, which doesn't sound a lot like a lot to a lot of parts of the world, but in the US, it was a disaster. It disgorged a whole generation of its uh, savings. And essentially, uh, destroyed the U.S. economy uh, to the point that no longer could households maintain a growing standard of living with just one income. Instead, you had to have both spouses go to work in order to maintain anything like a semblance of rising prosperity that Americans have, had come to expect. So there was a, a massive upheaval in, in social and cultural life in America, all a result of bad monetary policy. So in 1979, uh, things got, were so bad, uh, we had Carter's great malaise speech saying that, you know, look, I'm really sorry uh, that everyone's so miserable, but we're just going to have to endure it. He was overthrown uh, in favor of, of Ronald Reagan, who brought in a new central banker named Paul Volcker, who had a new theory. And his new theory was that Keynesianism was terrible, it didn't work, we're going to try monetarism now for the first time. Now, monetarism is, was the theory of Milton Friedman Again, an application of science to monetary policy that if, that if you can cobble together a perfect uh, um, equation of exchange that, that disciplined the rate of monetary increase to exactly equal the rate of, of productivity and were able to keep a velocity exactly the same, 
then you could maintain a stable price level, right? This is just math. It's just a simple application of math, a very simple equation of exchange. So we saw the introduction of monetarist policy, and that's exactly what happened. Massively reduced the rate of monetary increase of, of inflation, and we saw inflation go from you know, 13, 14, 15 percent collapse down to the rates of 2 and 3 percent. Of course, the U.S. economy inter entered into a huge recession in those days. It's fascinating. We can't even imagine this. But the policy at the elites at the, at the time thought that inflation was, a, was, that recession was a tolerable phase. It was like the hangover after a night of partying. It's something you had to just get through. And everything would be fine afterwards, and that's indeed what happened. But the mon monetarism is, is an amazing kind of theory in a way, like the ultimate kind of pretense of knowledge, because look what it assumes. It assumes that you know the rate of productivity, the rate of GDP increase on a national level. Forget about global. It's a national monetary theory in an age of emergent globalism, so that alone is false. Uh, productivity is not something you can really measure as it's happening. You're always measuring it after it's already happened. So that's a serious problem. It's a little like, like, like driving forward while looking in the rear view mirror, you know? Uh, so that doesn't really work either. Uh, it presumes that you can maintain a constant pace of velocity of money, which actually, in fact, you can't control. Velocity of money is determined by consumer behavior, what people do with their money, what is their demand for money, <coughs> at what rate are they spending, at what rate are they saving. That's something that government can't control. I mean, you know, government's very powerful, but actually it cannot tell you in this room whether you're willing to spend 60 uh, New Zealand dollars for a bottle of gin, which I just did this morning, which I can't believe I did. But, uh, <laughs> but it can't control whether you do that or not, and yet that's the essence of the equation of exchange. You have to control velocity and maintain a normal level of velocity or the equation of exchange doesn't work. The third, like, terrible and insane assumption of monetarism is that you know what the monetary money supply is. Right? Now, you think that would be a normal thing to be able to count how much money there is? Not true in a world of central banking. Nobody really knows. And the amazing thing about monetarism is that it was implemented at the very same time as we had financial and, and banking deregulation occur in 1982 and 1983. So we had basically about 18 months of a coherent experiment in monetarism, and then the whole thing just completely blew up thanks to financial deregulation. Now, financial deregulation is a little bit misnamed. And this is, by the way, as long as you're counting up my steps here, we have naive science, war and revolution is number two. First wave Keynesianism is number three. Second wave Keynesianism is number four with Richard Nixon. Number five is monetarism. Number six, the period of deregulation. Deregulation wasn't really the application of market economics to banking. Uh, because banks, since they've been totally centralized and protected against failure, we're in no position to assess, again, the cost of their enterprises and to provide a realistic assessment of risk associated with their lending patterns. So all their potential losses were essentially socialized while their profits were completely privatized. That was banking deregulation. The Glass-Steagall Act of the early 1930s was repealed. Now banks could get into all sorts of securities lending. There were uh, an explosion of new financial instruments like money market mutual funds and money, money, money market deposit accounts, eventually ending in um, uh, things like mortgage-backed securities, which, which tons of, of investment banks held. I mean, the world of, of banking that we see it today, today as today would not have been possible without this world of financial deregulation. But look what happened. By 1984 and 1985, there was so much chaos in the world of money that people could no longer even count how much there was. And all these years, I was doing sort of really detailed money uh, uh, research for, a, uh, for an organization that was trying to provide an alternative analysis of what was going on in the world of money, aside from, from what the Federal Reserve was, was pumping out and what the uh, monetarists were pushing out. And I can tell you, it was, it was utterly impossible at the time to know whether money was increasing or decreasing in its supply. It depended on how you measured it. You know, by 1980, there was pretty much one reliable measure, M1. By 1985, there was M1, M2, M3, and then eventually there was uh, MZM, money of zero maturity, which is, a, you know, I think probably the most reliable piece of statistics. But to know whether something was increasing or falling, increasing or decreasing, it all depended on how you measured it. Were you going to go on uh, uh, weekly increases, uh, monthly increases, 
12-month uh, 12, uh, 12 trending? You know, are you going to seasonally adjust um, the inflation rates? How, how are you going to measure this? And the truth is you can come up with any statistics you want, actually. A really agile monetary economist can paint any picture he wants of the monetary world because nobody really knows. And we saw the SNL uh, crisis coming about in that time, which should have been the first great indication that there was a serious problem, uh, ultimately leading to the housing boom of the, of the 2000s, which is entirely, again, fueled by Federal Reserve policy, uh, leading to the, the, the final uh, stage, which I like to call a third wave Keynesianism and monetary breakdown. Now, when I was in graduate school in the, 19, um, in, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was common wisdom that Keynesianism was dead. And everybody had forgotten about it. It's been discredited theory. It's not coming back again. Suddenly, 2008 comes along. And uh, we saw the world financial system almost completely collapse. I mean, how vulnerable was the world monetary system at this point? I mean, US uh, housing prices fell you know, at most 20 to 25% in one sector. And that almost brought down the world economy. I mean, that's pretty darn vulnerable, actually. It was massive and widespread panic on the part of the American elites. Uh, and they passed, you know, just initially in the fall of 2008, when all this became really obvious that it was going uh, to happen, we began to get warnings from George Bush that unless we passed this $400, $400 billion spending bill, that uh, you would go to your ATMs, you wouldn't be able to withdraw cash. You know, there was widespread panic. I remember at the time being amazed at how addicted the American public was to debt as an instrument of, of personal finance. Uh, I was laughing because, because the reporters, of course, who, who are just like universally idiotic when it comes to economics, they're hanging around car lots and interviewing people. And I remember an interview with one guy, he's like, yeah, I don't know what's going on these days. He said, like, like I, just want, I just want a car, I want this new car, you know, and buying a car is good for the economy, it's good for me, but they want me to put down like $500. You know, I don't know what, what, how does this system work? And then the reporter would go, yes, and that's the level of suffering and tyranny and <laughs> desperation you see in the American economy today. So we saw a third wave of Keynesianism, which was really just a massive breakdown of the system. The US Federal Reserve, again, just like the early 19, uh, 1930s, decided to manufacture an inflation and adopted a new policy called which is really a Keynesian policy, called uh, Zero Interest Rate Policy, or ZERP, uh, which they decided to abolish interest, basically. And what did that do? Did it manufacture inflation? Again, no. And again, the same reasons. Uh, they couldn't control velocity. Velocity has been in a free fall ever since 2008. Nobody talks about this, but you can go to the St. Louis uh, st uh, Fed statistics and look at velocity falling. People no longer trust the banking system. Uh, people are basically hoarding money outside the banking system ever more. Um, and you can't count the money. So suddenly, the Federal Reserve has lost complete control of its ability to manage the monetary stock. That's been going on since 2008. It really was the end of an era, 100 years of hell, entirely fueled by central banking, central banking war, depression, tyranny, gulags, internment camps, gas chambers, you name it. Uh, this science, this naive science that you saw in the early part of the 20th century that ended in utter disaster and calamity to the point now that you, know, you can't really take seriously any press conference you see from the Federal Reserve. They always look like they're in control of the system. They really don't know what the hell is going on at all. They're completely clueless. Today, most of the inflation they manufactured since, 19, since 2008 has, has ended not in, massive, not in the price increases that they wanted, but just the reverse. Um, uh, a deflationary pressure that nobody can stop, combined with um, a huge asset inflation that's taking place within the shadow banking system. And what happens after that, I don't, I don't really know. Now, how does this get us to Bitcoin? And this is the really beautiful thing. Uh, the white paper was released October 31st of 2008, really at the very height of this monetary crisis. 
very few people paid attention at all. Um, the Genesis block came out, I believe, January 9th of 2009. The first emergence, is that the right day? The first emergence of, the, of, uh, of Bitcoin as a monetary reality. I was at the time the editor of a, uh, one of the world's most popular economics websites called Mises.org. And I was getting notes all throughout that year from people saying, you really should pay attention to Bitcoin. There's something really important about this. And I remember just laughing, reading these articles that were being sent to me and thinking, how naive can you be that you think that you can create a money out of computer code, release it on a free form on the internet, and expect it to amount to anything? Hey, do you not know anything about monetary theory at all? I guess not. You're just another crank, right? That was 2009, 2010. Instead of putting down these writers, I should have been mining, is what I should have been doing. You know? <laughs> Would have been the right thing to do. Um, and I know we're, we're really short of time right now, but I just would like to quickly review for you just like a brief history of Bitcoin, which I'm hoping that, and there are many great books coming out of Bitcoin right now, uh, about Bitcoin right now, but this is the really important history. It's opened up a new chapter. It closed one chapter of history, namely the chapter of monetary nationalism and government control of money and central banking, and opened up a new chapter, which is uh, a, a restoration in many ways, of private ownership of gold, of, um, of money, and management of, mo of money through markets rather than, than governments. It really was you know, the, beginning, the end of one era and the beginning of a new era. Does anybody know what the value of Bitcoin was between uh, January 9th and October 5th of 2009? I mean, yeah, somebody holds up a, a symbol like that, right? As far as we know, it has zero value whatsoever. An amazing thing. So it exactly, and then suddenly October 5th of 2009, we see the first posted price of Bitcoin, which is something like a 15th of a penny. A very epic event in human history. Very few people understood what it would amount to, but it follows exactly the course of money's emergence that Carl Menger talks about in his great book, Principle of Economics of, of, of 1871, actually. Um, a, a gradual emergent technology that took on value as people began to use it. The value of, of Bitcoin turns out to be the, the value of the blockchain itself, which people still do not understand. Commentators all over the world are still talking about Bitcoin, still completely clueless about what it means. So what can we look forward to the future? Here's my prediction for you. And as, as Andreas rightly said, we're just at the very beginning stages of this. In the future, money will be private. Government money will continue to be used in the same sense that people use government post office today for official correspondence. You know, China has a, a post office today that's used for official correspondence, but otherwise uh, there are thousands and thousands of private delivery services. It wasn't gotten rid of, it's just been made obsolete. That's what I see the future of government, government money being. You'll need it to pay your taxes, but otherwise you won't be using it for any other purpose. It will be private currency, whether it's Bitcoin or some other uh, cryptocurrency, I don't know. This is the trajectory of the world today. We are leaving the era of central banking and monetary nationalism and entering into a world of peer-to-peer digital-based currencies. And what's more, what's most interesting to me about this is that the central bankers may be pompous, uh, uh, they may be insufferable, and they may be tyrannical, but they're not altogether stupid, and they know this. This is why the Federal Reserve has been very reluctant to condemn Bitcoin, because it's so much a superior technology to national money. When governments took over money 100 years ago, they froze it, made it static, uh, made it immune to any kind of improvements uh, and entrepreneurship and innovation. You hurled forward 100 years with the invention of Bitcoin, what we discover is what we had missed all along. A beautiful, secure money that could be uh, ported peer-to-peer -peer around the world, a, a bundle of information that could be titled and commodified and transmitted without regard to geographic uh, contingencies uh, and can be the basis of a global monetary system at very, very low cost. It's, it's like a miracle unfolding before our eyes. And we're just at the very beginnings of this. There is no way that a technology that is this superior 
to our existing technologies can be held back. They can slow us down, but they can't stop it. Once something's invented, it can't be uninvented. The blockchain exists as part of a reality. One of the things I like to do when I give Bitcoin talks, because we pretend as if we're debating Bitcoin, all right? I debated a regulator at Boston University the other day, and he was sitting there, you know, like against, against Bitcoin. And, 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 and instead of debating him about whether or not Bitcoin is a good idea or not, I just put up the, uh, the beautiful site, I don't know if you've ever seen it, BitListen, right? That has little bubbles coming up as Bitcoin is being spent, you know, one by one. And I turned off the sound just to let it emerge. And I didn't say anything about it other than to point it out to the beginning of my talk, this is the world that's being emerged, that's emergent today. This is happening. Regardless of anything that goes on in this room, whatever your opinions are, you can be for it, you can be against it, you can be skeptical, you can make all your kind of predictions. This is the world that's emerging. We no longer are in control. The intellectuals are being toppled from their positions of power. The central bankers are re being reduced to essentially just you know, on-air PR, uh, uh, public relations people for the large banks and governments. It doesn't matter. The world is changing, it's emerging. There's nobody in, th in this room who's going to be able to reverse that or make it go forward. Essentially, all of us as individuals have, been, uh, have become, in a way, super powerful, uh, but also like completely powerless. And that's certainly true of central bankers, uh, too. Nobody's going to be able to stop this future from being built. I love being alive in our times, because I have like total confidence every night when I go to sleep that while I'm sleeping, the world is becoming a better place, thanks to Bitcoin. When I wake up in the morning, you know, I'm conscious Bitcoin has made a few advances overnight. It's a beautiful thing. We will not be forever kept in cages. Humanity is too creative and, 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 and too innovative to be held back by these reactionary, looting institutions that have ruled us for 100 years. I look forward to a future of monetary freedom and sound money thanks to the great innovation of Satoshi. Thank you so much for listening to me today. I think I have a few minutes for questions or are we out of time? I'm so sorry, but I'm going to be here uh, the rest of the day and tomorrow. Thank you so much.